Hi everyone, welcome to part one of Jacksonian America. As a reminder, please read the OpenStax chapter related to this topic and watch the Crash Course US History videos that go along with this topic as well. When we take a look at the first part of Jacksonian America, I wanna focus on the nullification crisis. So your questions to think about, how does South Carolina justify nullification? This goes along with your journal, so I'll give you some insight into this. And then second, why does the nullification crisis happen? So as John Green talks about in the video, the South Carolinians, and in fact other Southerners, are very upset about the Tariff of 1828. They called it the Tariff of Abominations. This was a really high tariff that hit them pretty hard because Southerners, being an agricultural society, didn't have a lot of manufacturing. So they had to import manufactured goods, a high tariff, means they pay more for these goods. In 1828, John C. Calhoun, pictured at the bottom of the screen there, he was Andrew Jackson's vice president, and he's from South Carolina. In his South Carolina exposition and protest, he explains why this tariff is so bad. In fact, South Carolinians are going to argue that the tariff is so unfair that it's unconstitutional. Now, the other thing that's important about John Calhoun's South Carolina exposition and protest is that he is going to resurrect the idea of nullification. But nothing really comes of it. Fast forward to 1832. Congress passes a new tariff, but it's really only a small decrease in the rate. So South Carolinians are really not happy. So in November of 1832, the South Carolina legislature is going to allow a convention, a nullification convention, to be held. And the delegates to that convention are going to decide whether or not they want to formally nullify the tariffs of 1828 and 1832. But they take it a step further. First of all, they do vote yes. They want to nullify these tariffs. But they also argue that they need the state to prevent the collection of federal taxes in the state. So in other words, South Carolina is telling the national government that this tariff, this law, doesn't apply to them. Now, what makes this also very important is because this is a legitimate concern that South Carolina has. They really are upset about the tariff. But there's a bigger issue waiting in the background, and that is the issue of slavery. Ever since the Revolutionary War, the abolitionist movement, the anti-slavery movement, has been growing in the North. And as the population of the North grows, Southerners are worried that they're going to get outvoted in Congress. So it's almost as if this fight against the tariff is a, a practice run, a dress rehearsal for being able to nullify any anti-slavery law that comes along. So in order to prevent the collection of taxes, South Carolina Governor Robert Hayne is going to call up the state militia. These, these are armed men who are going to actively prevent the collection of taxes in the state. This is so wild. But from the South Carolina pers perspective, they see this as necessary to protect themselves, to protect their authority. It's almost as if South Carolina is still thinking in terms of the Articles of Confederation, where the states had the power, rather than the Constitution that we're living under in the 1820s and 1830s. Andrew Jackson, of course, is angry. He is furious. He sees this as not only dangerous in a constitutional sense, that South Carolina is challenging the national government, but Jackson also sees this as personally off offensive. Like he is personally offended that South Carolina is challenging his authority. 
So he calls up the Secretary of War to prepare the U.S. Army for military action. So in other words, Andrew Jackson is about to send the U.S. Army to South Carolina, and the governor is preparing the militia to defend the state. I mean, we're almost on the verge of an armed conflict between the United States government and a state. Now, the other thing that Jackson's going to do is he's going to ask Congress for the force bill. This is a law that would allow the U.S. Army to collect taxes in South Carolina. Now, technically, if you look at the Constitution, the job of the president is to enforce the laws. So Jackson would be perfectly within his constitutional rights to send the army into South Carolina to collect the taxes. But Americans get a little squeamish. Americans get a little uncomfortable if the army is going to be used to collect taxes. So Andrew Jackson, President Jackson, wants to make sure that everyone understands that this, that what he's about to do is perfectly constitutional. Meanwhile, Henry Clay from Kentucky is building on his reputation as the great compromiser. So Henry Clay is working in Congress to develop a compromise tariff that will eventually become the the Compromise Tariff of 1833. And this would gradually lower the tariff until it was lower than it was in 1828. This isn't exactly what South Carolina wants, but they, I think they really had a holy crap moment. Like, holy crap, we're about to be invaded by the United States Army. And if we don't find a solution out of this, we're going to be in big trouble. So South Carolina is going to accept the Compromise Tariff of 1833, but just to be stubborn, just to show that they're standing on their principle, they nullify the force bill. Now, what's funny about that is that as soon as South Carolina agrees to the Compromise Tariff, the force bill expires. So it's no longer in existence. So South Carolina has just nullified an expired law. Now, why is all of this so important? First of all, after the nullification crisis, South Carolina is going to become very hysterical, militant when it comes to defending the authority of the states. Uh, So they've brought back this compact theory of government. This is all what justifies nullification, is that the states have given power to the national government, and therefore they have some authority or control over it. So that's part of it, is that this idea of the compact theory of government comes back, never mind what the Supreme Court said in McCullough versus Maryland, South Carolina really doesn't care. But South Carolina is increasingly worried that the abolitionist movement is growing so rapidly that there might be something happening on the national level, the federal level, that would interfere with the institution of slavery in the state. Now, the key element here is that South Carolina is going to become very concerned. They're very militant. They're going to defend their authority very vigorously. But what's surprising is that no other state stood with South Carolina on this issue. Like, it's almost like no one had South Carolina's back. It's 1833. By the time we get a few more years down the road, that's going to change. So we're going to keep an eye on that. But for now, no other state stands with South Carolina. Okay, so recapping our questions to think about. How does South Carolina justify nullification? South Carolina is going to bring back the compact theory of government. And if the states had given power to the national government, if the states had created the national government, then nullification would really be a thing. It would be allowed. So in order to justify nullification, they have to bring back the compact theory. 
And then why does the nullification crisis happen? It happens because South Carolina is challenging the authority of the U.S. government, not just over the tariff, which is the the image, the issue in front of us, but also because of the institution of slavery. They're worried that the national government might abolish slavery and there would be nothing that South Carolina could do about it. Stay tuned for part two.